All right. Uh, yeah. Uh, thank you. It's my great pleasure to uh, visit the uh, Flatland Institute. Uh, I think it's my second time here. Last time I forgot, it's 2018, 2019, uh, before the pandemic. So it's good to be back. And um, well, thank you for attending uh, talk. Uh, today I will be uh, talking about a uh, mostly concentrating on the interplay between topology and correlation uh, in semiconductor memory materials. Okay. Uh, just very quick, uh, the building block of the material that uh, we'll be looking at is um, monolayer transition method dipocogen and semiconductor TMDs. This is the structure I believe that many are familiar. If you look from top down, it has a honeycomb structure just like graphene. Uh, but because the two subjective sites are actually occupied by different atoms, so the inversion symmetry is broken, then uh, the rock comb uh, turns into an energy gap at the K and the K prime point of the Brillouin zone. And furthermore, because of the rather heavy 4D or 5D atoms uh, in the structure, uh, there's strong spin orbit interaction. And that actually can uh, that splits the spin states uh, at the K and the K prime as well. Just that the K and the K prime are time reversal copies of each other, so that you know this is spin up, that is spin down, just like that. So that's the basic electronic property for the <coughs> intrinsic semiconductor. The Fermi energy is located in the middle of here. So that's the building block. And I don't think I need to talk too much about moray. Uh, just like uh, graphene, you can actually twist them to form morays. But I want to just point out that two, two different ways to do it uh, in this class of material. Uh, you can use two of the same materials, like uh, in the Columbia group, they would use tungsten selenide on top of tungsten selenide and give it a twist. And you'll just get a 10 nanometer ish. Uh, Mori period, or you can use heterobilayers uh, that you use two different layers, but not not uh, utilizing the twist angle, but actually util utilizing the uh, lattice mismatch delta here in order to produce an interference pattern in the atomic structure to produce a moray super lattice. So this example is uh, tungsten selenide on top of tungsten sulfide at exact zero twist angle, and you still get a uh, about eight nanometer ish uh, moray period. Can I ask a yeah. very basic question? How, how do you actually get the zero degree twist? Because they're not, it's not like a tear and stack. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So it's a little bit more involved compared to uh, this kind of structure. I, I, that's why I think most people are still doing the twisted by layer. Uh, you first have to predetermine the crystal lattice structure. And luckily, uh, this material, because it breaks the inversion symmetry, uh, you can use a second harmonics generation, which is an optical technique, non invasive rather conveniently to actually find the crystal orientation to a pretty high precision, to about 0.5 degree precision, which sounds very bad if you're talking about a twisted bilayer graphene magic angle, 1.1 degree has to be very precise near there. But then that's actually the next slide that is not that bad here, because maybe I'll just go into this part here first. Uh, this is the dependence of the Moray period as a function of twist angle for both the homo bilayer and the hetero bilayer. For homo bilayer, is strongly dependent on the twist angle, especially the small twist angle. This is in log scale. And so that's sort of expected because in the small twist angle limit, this is the formula, right, for the Moray period when it diverges uh, near the zero twist angle. But for heterobilayer, uh, it's determined by the lattice mismatch uh, in zero twist angle. So it's rather independent of the twist angle there. So even you're off by like 0.5 degree, it's nothing. It's yeah. actually very uh, robust. So that's in this sense, it's sort of a little bit better, you know, the heterobilayer that is less susceptible to Shisenko disorders. And uh, on the left here, you can actually see the, uh, not very clearly, the STM images of the Moray superlattice structure. You can see actually the small atoms and as well as the interference pattern of the atoms, the Moray structure. Uh, it, as we sort of zoom in to show a few sites, but you can zoom out that uh, even hundreds of sites, it's actually quite uh, regular in this kind of a heterobilayer structure. And this is uh, the collaboration with Dave Muller's group at, I, at a Cornell. So um, I, I think the message is actually that uh, the heterobilayer tend to have uh, less just angle disorder compared to the homobilayer case, but the other type of disorder <coughs> should still be there. Okay, um, unlike graphene, you actually can think of a, the, the electronic structure in this type of material that uh, you just, sort of forget about the original atom because as long as you are dealing with low energy physics, uh, there is a nice separation of the link scale. So you can forget about the original atoms and treat the electron with a certain band mass of the TMD to move in this uh, smooth periodic Moray potential. And the effect will be then you just get actually a zone voting from the big brilliant zones to the mini brilliant zone 
and then some additional black reflection near the zone edge of the mini virulent zone and opens up a mini gap here and then produces a series of the uh, more flat bands. Okay, uh, which is a, uh, this, this picture is actually a good approximation here. And uh, it has been shown in 2018 by uh, Alan McDonald's group that if you have a well isolated enough Moray band in your system, then you can actually uh, map the low energy physics to a triangular lattice Hubble model. Uh, I think many people here are familiar with that. And you just treat each of these Moray sites as an artificial atom with a trapping potential of about 200 milli electron volt. Then the electron traps in each of these sites can tunnel with an amplitude T, uh, interact with the on site U, and then the nearest neighbor Coulomb V as well. Just to give you a sense of the energy scale, T is about one to 10 milli electron volt, depending on the tuning parameters in your experiment and as well as a uh, type of material that you're dealing with. Essentially, it's mostly controlled by the trapping depth of this Moray potential. Uh, U is, you can also estimate using the calculated size of the one year orbital. Uh, it's about 100 milli electron volt. And um, the uh, nearest neighbor uh, repulsion is B, uh, it's about 50 milli electron volt. You can estimate using the dielectric constant of the environment and the Moray period. And um, of course, you may ask actually how well this is this single band uh, Hubble model approximation is. Uh, I think as long as we're talking about the first Hubble band, it's a pretty good uh, approximation. But uh, you can, uh, in many cases, the U is actually bigger than this mini gap size here. So uh, it doesn't really work for the next. I think the next Hubble band will be more complicated. But I think the first Hubble band works quite well. OK, uh, in the past couple of years, uh, I think there are many works uh, from our group, from uh, Berkeley group, from Columbia group, mapping out uh, the phase diagram of this uh, artificial Hubble system. Uh, you can actually tune the bandwidth. Uh, I'm not going to talk too much about the Hubble system in this talk, but you can tune the bandwidth using an electric field, or you can use a uh, A voltage to tune a, the filling factors of the electrons inside each Moray atom. Uh, there are many things observed, like the mod insulating states at a uh, half band filling. Uh, you can tune the bandwidth to induce a mod transition. And there are many works actually uh, happened here trying to understand uh, the bandwidth tune the mod transition. And also at a certain commensurate fractional filling factors, uh, a series of uh, so-called electron crystal states or the generalized Wigman crystal states uh, have been detected. And you can also tune the bandwidth to actually kill those states into a, and turn it into a Fermi liquid as well. Okay. So I'm sorry, just for orientation, can I ask about your conventions? Is filling factor two is the completely filled insulator? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And okay. And then at which point, if any, in the heterobilayer, do you start to get overlap with other bands? I mean, in other words, is the is the mini gap such that uh, there's a complete separation between the lowest energy of the upper band and the highest energy of the lower band, or if you go down in doping, do you start to depopulate the second mini band? before you finish them being the first one, if you see what I mean. Yeah, I, I think um, your yeah, staying here is probably pretty good that it's uh, it's really like the first, it's like the uh, still, lower half a band of the first band. <laughs> okay, yeah. So we still believe that down to the interesting filling factors, you're you're still just in the first mini band and we don't have to think about the second one. I, I believe so, but uh, near here may be more complicated. No, no, when, when it's totally filled, there's nothing going on. That's, that's why I was asking. Right. If, if you're very near the top, then it's clear the second mini band isn't doing anything. As you lower, the question is, where do you hit the second mini band? So I would have thought you will need it closer to filling factor zero than filling factor one, unless I have my conventions backwards. Oh, uh, yeah. Well, we, 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 I think we're talking about valence band here. So I think I'm also a little bit. Yeah. OK. Yeah. So, so the question is, is zero completely filled valence band? Or is two completely filled? Z zero down. is completely filled. Okay, thank, thank you. That, that now, now I understand <laughs> what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you could get into trouble between one and two with occupying the next yes. mini band, but between zero and one is good. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. I okay. So. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I think that's it. Uh, that's what I, what I want to talk about this uh, because the talk uh, here, I will be mostly focusing on the interpe on interplay between uh, topology and correlation. Uh, so another paper uh, from uh, the McDonald group in 2019, uh, they predicted that if you actually, you don't really have a well isolated enough band, but you actually have two bands that they can sort of intertwine with the complex hopping between these two bands. And you can produce uh, 
a band with value resolved trend number that equal to, equal to plus minus one, right? And the low energy physics can actually be mapped in this case to a K Malay model that uh, each of this band is actually producing a triangular lattice structure, but they are that each of this side is occupying different sublattices in a honeycomb. Uh, so that the low energy physics is exactly the same as the K-Malay model that you have a uh, nearest neighbor hopping T and the next nearest neighbor hopping T prime. And also you can uh, include a term that in, uh, takes into account the sublattice potential difference uh, between the two sides, which you can tune by a, applying a vertical electric field to the material. And um, so that's uh, the proposal for a mobile layer system. Uh, and, and actually what we find is that there is this material I will mainly focus on today. Uh, this is a, uh, we can call it the Bernal stack or AB stack monetary tungsten selenide or layer. And the two layer has a rather la large lattice mismatch, 7% uh, uh, lattice mismatch. And the Moray period is rather small. It's like five nanometer. So a little smaller compared to uh, most of the cases. And DFT calculation uh, from Liang Fu's group actually showed that uh, the top valence band is from the Molly layer. And it occupies actually the A site, the, the one year orbital occupies the A site of the honeycomb. And then the next valence band is from the tungsten. <coughs> and it occupies the B site of the honeycomb, like this. this. This is the green, and that's the orange, right? Like this. And uh, the next nearest neighbor hopping in this honeycomb is actually like the intra layer hopping. This T prime is the intra layer hopping that's producing the bandwidth uh, of each of this band. And the interlayer hopping here, T, is actually the, uh, the nearest neighbor hopping is actually the interlayer hopping here. And that is actually smaller than the interlayer hopping T prime. Okay. So we are sort of in this interesting limit that the T prime is bigger than T uh, in, a, in, in, in a K Malay model. And you can apply a vertical electric field to the system because you remember that the sub lattice potential difference in this honeycomb is actually equal to the interlayer potential difference. So you can just apply a vertical electric field and that can cause a stock shift to just shift the relative alignments between the two bands. And you can introduce band inversion by applying a vertical electric field. And this T coupling, the interlayer coupling would reopen the energy gap and produce a uh, churn bands with very resolved churn number plus minus one uh, in the system. Okay. And the low energy physics can still be mapped to a, uh, the, the, the K-Malay model uh, except that it's in this funny limit that the T prime is bigger than a T uh, in the system. And uh, band inversion is continuously tunable by the electric field. And I hope this is clear that, about the system. I have one question. Yes. So here, this AB stack is means 180 degree test. It's it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So yeah. like, what's the, if we use like zero, like if it's zero angle, we'll some will it happen some similar phenomena or it's mapped to another yeah phenomenon? actually you would expect uh, the zero the AA stack we call it to be uh, to have some a similar property uh, we did not observe it uh, for reasons that we still don't completely understand uh, in the AA stack there is actually strong coupling between these two bands mm -hmm. uh, the, we, we, the T term actually would be big compared to the T prime term mm -hmm. um, we don't know why in our experiment that we actually, because actually in the AA stacking, this would be really like the original proposal from a, uh, a McDonald's yeah. group that they are also dealing with a AA stacks uh, homo bilayer twist. So you would expect them to be similar, uh, but we, we did not see it. <laughs> okay. But I'm sorry, a related question, right? The, the magic is, if you go to your next slide, Right. The magic is that the two bands, the MO and the W, curve in opposite ways. So the sine of T prime is opposite for the two. Right. Because the W band is dispersing down and the MO band is dispersing up. Yeah, yeah. And that's why you get something interesting when you start interchanging. Where does that come from? I mean, I could imagine a situation where they both, you know, vary with K in the same way. Yeah. Um... I don't know whether I have a very good answer for this, but uh, I think uh, it's related to the fact that in each monolayer at the K or the K prime point, that uh, it breaks effectively it breaks the time reversal symmetry at each of this value. So I think it is possible to have a complex a uh, T prime hopping in the system because of that uh, effective time reversal symmetry breaking within each value. 
but I don't know. Okay. I think I, I cannot tell you the exact reason why it's producing an opposite. It has to produce an opposite version. Yeah. Okay. Can I also ask a question? So the, in this band folding picture, uh, I would imagine that they would come from the same band. So you're saying that they come from different K values. What, what, what is the, why do you associate one with Mu and one with tungsten? In the, so if I would think about the band folding, would they yeah, come actually, from the, the same type of? Uh, the, the, the band folding also has some uh, trickiness in it. Right, I think uh, right. it's actually that a one value would, uh, would map to the K of the mini and so on. Right. And the other layer from the same value would actually map to the K prime of the mini and zone. So and uh, that actually is uh, sort of important to. Uh, so the two bands which are closest to the Fermi level, they would come from different layers. Yes, yes. OK. Um, yeah, so uh, this is the typical device structure, and I think many of you are familiar. The Maurice sample encapsulated between two uh, boron nitride dielectric uh, with the top and the bottom gate electrode. And we have two degrees of freedom because of the top and the bottom gate, so we can independently tune the electron density in the system, and in this case, it would be the whole density. And we can also apply a vertical electric field without changing the electron density. Uh, to just change the to tune the uh, band immersion in the system. And on the right, it's a typical device structure. This is where the Maurice sample is within this a uh, flat line here, this uh, box here. And uh, it's contacted by multiple electrodes so that you can uh, perform transport measurements and you can also shoot laser beam at the center to measure uh, some optics as well. Okay. So uh, I will begin. Uh, so this is the outline of the talk. I will be. Uh, just show, show the outline as a phase diagram that we know so far. This axis is band immersion that can be tuned by electric field. And this is the uh, filling factor axis that can be tuned also by the gate voltages. Uh, again, one yeah, electron will be one. Uh, filling factor one here will be one hole uh, per Moray unit cell. Two would be two holes per Moray unit cell. Okay. And uh, I will be mainly focusing on filling factor one and filling factor two where most of the regions are actually insulating states and it's easier to understand. Uh, I will just briefly mention, you know, you can also see lots of interesting things when you move away from filling factor one and filling factor two and Fermi liquids, they are also very interesting as well. And uh, I will just begin with filling factor two and uh, most of the physics is actually single particle physics. And uh, then I'll go to filling factor one uh, uh, with a lot of correlation physics going on. So at filling factor two, we just put the Fermi energy in the middle between the two bands, and then we just use an electric field to cause band immersion and just see what happens. Right. So just to give you a flavor that uh, how well uh, uh, the experimental data is actually captured by the, this, this model here. OK. So uh, this is the first thing that we actually measure. Uh, this is the measurement geometry. We just pass, it's a very standard four point measurement. We pass a current in the longitudinal direction and measure the longitudinal voltage drop. Uh, this two voltage probe actually covers an edge in the system. And so this is the data, uh, which is the resist uh, longitudinal resistance versus the electric field kept at filling factor equal to two. And the electric field caused band immersion and the band immersion point is actually at this point here, 0.42 volt per nanometer. Before band immersion, you can actually see that the, resist the resistance actually diverge to decreasing temperature. So there's an insulator. But after band immersion in this measurement geometry, you can actually see that at low temperature, the resistivity sort of saturates uh, to a certain value. And this value is fairly close to a 13 kilo ohm H over 2 E square uh, resistance. So it's suggestive that we are actually turning the system into a quantum spin hall uh, insulator. And you can actually compare uh, with another measurement geometry that is really measuring the bulk of the material rather than uh, just avoiding the edge. And how we do it is actually we apply AC excitation voltage here and we collect the current from the other side, but grounding these two electrodes. So basically the current that we measure has to go through the bulk of the system. So it's an effective Corvino geometry type of measurement. And the voltage job we measure is these two electrodes. So it's, a, it's, it's effectively measuring the bulk in this measurement. Then the bottom is the data. 
that the resistivity in this geometry versus the electric field, you can actually see that both before inversion and after the band inversion, the resistivity will diverge with decreasing temperature. And when you measure the bulk, it's actually an insulator if the, uh, even after band inversion. So um, the next is actually comparing the temperature dependence of the resistivity in these two geometries of measurement. If you measure the bulk, it just keeps diverging uh, with a uh, decreasing temperature. But if you measure the edge, it tends to saturate uh, to H over two E square uh, resistivity. So um, I, I believe that um, this results together with some other control experiments that we do uh, with non-local transport and uh, angle dependent magnetic resistance. We are fairly confident to say that uh, after band immersion, the system indeed enters into a quantum spin or insulator at a filling factor equal to two. And uh, if, you, if you don't uh, completely trust me at this point, uh, you can further do one more thing is actually that if the system is really like a K Malay model with a icing type of spin off interaction, it's actually like two copies of a Haldane model, right? So you can actually apply an external magnetic field to break the time reversal symmetry to sort of reduce two copies into one copy, and you will get a churn insulator described by the Haldane model. And this is quite easy to be done in the AB stack structure. Because in the AB stack structure, within each valley of the two layers, the spins are actually opposite aligned to each other. So this is actually more like a spin resolved band structure uh, from the two layers. This is like spin down at K, spin up at K prime for the Molly, and it's just reversed for the tungsten band. Right. So with this kind of band alignment, it's very easy to use the Zeeman term to actually. Uh, just to cause a band inversion in one of the values without actually causing a band inversion in the other value. For instance, if you start with a 2DTI or a quantum spin hole insulator just immediately after band inversion under zero magnetic field, you increase the magnetic field, the perpendicular magnetic field. And because of this special spin alignment within each value of the system, then you will actually close the energy gap at one of the values only with the Zeeman energy term. And the other, the other value, actually, the gap size would just keep increasing by the Zeeman energy. And ultimately, the Zeeman energy would just uh, cause a band inversion at one of the values. In this case, would be the K value, but not the K prime value. And it just turned the system into a churn insulator in this case. Right? So uh, schematically, in the real, real space picture, would be that you start with the state with the helical edge state. Then increasing the magnetic field, you close the gap at one value, you sort of push one of one copies of the helical edge state to the bulk, and then you just uh, have the chiral edge stay left after the <laughs> band immersion in one of the valleys. And uh, experimentally, it actually works. Uh, let me just go through this plot with you. Uh, this is the longitudinal resistance versus the two gate voltages. And along this direction is the electric field direction. And this resistivity peak is corresponding to a new equal to two resistivity peak. And that's the band inversion point. Before that, it's actually the band insulator. And after that, it's a quantum spin hole insulator in this region. And the electric field is going along this line to cause a band inversion at that point. And that's under zero magnetic field. Okay? And if you increase the magnetic field to one Tesla, you start to see a large hole response uh, sorry, these two maps are the whole response, and this map is the longitudinal uh, resistance. And you look at the whole response, you get a large whole response near the band inversion point. If you increase the magnetic field further, you actually get a larger uh, whole response uh, near the band inversion point. Then we can just cut a line here, a constant electric field near the band inversion, but just sweeping the filling factor. And then we can look at its magnetic field dependence along that line, right? Just this line, and then we just change the magnetic field. And you can actually see that this state does disperse with a magnetic field uh, using the Strader formula that you can actually uh, see that this, this, this dispersion is consistent with a, uh, with a churn insulator with a churn number equal to one. And that with the increasing magnetic field, the state would just go away from filling factor two. And that, this is sort of the line cut of the whole response along this line. And you can actually see that it has very large whole response, 15 kilo ohm, but it's not quantized. So it's not fully quantized uh, uh, with increasing magnetic field. And what is the reason that it's actually not fully quantized? Because from the dispersion, that it actually looks like it's a churn insulator with churn number equal to one, but it's not perfectly quantized. And the reason is actually it's a small gap churn insulator. 
So uh, this is the temperature dependence of the longitudinal resistivity, the, the blue dots here, and then the hall resistance, the black dots here. Uh, the turn gap basically is about three Kelvin. That's the point that the longitudinal resistivity starts to drop where the, uh, the chiral edge state starts to contribute significantly be, uh, below this temperature. So it's because of the rather small gap size of this churn insulator and, uh, and the presence of disorder in the system that actually destroy this perfect quantization uh, uh, in the temperature range that we can access in this study. So uh, I hope I, I convinced you that film factor equal to two, new equal to two, um, we get a, a, a topological phase transition from a band insulator to a quantum spindle insulator by uh, increasing electric field, which controls the band inversion. And we can also split the K-Malay model into a Haldane model uh, that would just a, uh, reduce two copies, um, basically reduce a quantum spindle insulator to a churn insulator. And I think it's sort of an interesting route in the future if you can proximity couple this material to a magnetic material, then you, don't, you can actually split the, the, the K-Malay model automatically at zero magnetic field to introduce a churn insulator by the proximity effect. All right. Uh, any questions? Uh, yeah, I have a question. So here, like the green band and the orange band, they are from opposite spin. And I wonder like how strong will they hybridize? Like, because like uh, initially, yeah, yeah, I guess yeah. due to the opposite spin, they will not hybridize. Yeah, much. yeah, actually, uh, it's a very good question. So that's why uh, the interlayer hopping T term is much smaller. It's actually not much, but it's smaller than the T prime, the interlayer hopping term, because of this spin forbidden, nearly mm -hmm. spin forbidden interlayer hopping. Uh, if it's actually the structure would be perfectly flat and the spins are really like uh, aligned to the outer plane, like Ising spins, then the hopping will be exactly zero, right? As, as you mentioned. But uh, it, uh, the, from the first principle calculation, what drives the T term to be non zero is actually the corrugation uh, of the structure. When you do the moray, then you actually can get some lattice relaxation. And it's the corrugation that uh, uh, destroys the perfect spin forbidden hopping. And that would turn the T term to be non zero. And we sort of know uh, the, the size of the T term from our experiment uh, because we can measure, actually measure the charge gap size after the band inversion. That's about one million electron volts. So that's sort of the energy scale of the, of the, of the interlayer hopping. Okay, it's nearly spin forbidden, but not, not entirely yet. Yeah. Um, so for the remaining time, I will be a, uh, mostly focusing on uh, filling factor one. Uh, the interplay of topology and correlation, I have to talk about correlation because I'm in the flat iron, right? And uh, so uh, in this case would be that the Fermi energy is located in the middle of the top Molly band. And then we just use the electric field to uh, cause band inversion and see what happens, right? And this is the work uh, from a group of a uh, postdoc and a graduate student. Okay, so uh, I'm just going to summarize uh, what we believe and then a, uh, I'm going to convince you that this may be the correct picture, okay? And what I'm showing here is exactly uh, keeping at a one hole per unit cell filling factor one. I'm showing the resistivity, the longitudinal resistance versus electric field. And you can actually see three different regions uh, in this plot. And for small electric field, Actually, the charges are all inside the Molly layer. That's, that's before band inversion. So the uh, holes are actually occupying a triangular lattice. And it's pretty much a triangular lattice, more insulator or triangular lattice charge transfer insulator. OK. <coughs> and the resistivity would just uh, go up with decreasing temperature. Then this first dash line is actually the band inversion point. And after this uh, electric field, uh, holes are actually transferred from the Molly layer to the tungsten layer. Okay. Uh, in that picture, would be that the holes in this case will be occupying a uh, honeycomb lattice structure, and the system will turn into a churn insulator. And uh, I'm going to sh uh, show you that this is indeed a churn insulator. So it's a churn insulator with a uh, small longitudinal resistance because our measurement covers an edge. Okay, and then finally, if you further increase the electric field to push more charges into the tungsten layer, 
and it actually goes through it looks like a critical point that the resistivity is nearly independent of temperature around this point at about 10 kilo ohm and then turn into another insulating state and we believe that this insulating state is an intervalic coherent state and the moments actually interact with anti-ferromagnetic interaction uh, with each other that i will also show some results and hopefully convince you that this is probably the uh, correct picture so that's a uh, the summary of uh, what i'm going to tell you then uh, I'll just begin with the middle region here, uh, which is the churn insulator. Oh, and also, I, 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 want to, I, I did not show the experimental data, but I also want to show that we actually have performed experiments to show that the charges are really transferred from the Molly layer to the tungsten layer, beginning at this dash line. So we know uh, quite well from our experiment that that's indeed the case that is happening. How do you know that? Um, maybe I can go to that. Yeah. So, we, we don't, not, not with all details, but just what's the general idea? Oh, the, that, yeah, the general idea is that uh, the optical resonance in each layer is very sensitive to, to doping. Uh -huh. So before this point, the tungsten layer, uh, it has a very strong neutral exciton. We know that it's charge neutral. And after this point, the neutral exciton turns into the charge excitons, which are the uh, so-called uh, polarons in the, in, the, in the system. Then uh, we actually will see that there's a dramatic change in the optical response in the system by just going across this line. And in this picture, the density really goes from sort of one zero to a half half, or it varies smoothly. It varies smoothly, actually. Uh, okay. Yeah, we can uh, also, yeah, actually, over this region of the electric field, most of the holes are still residing in the Molly layer. Okay. Yeah, you have to actually push way more to get to get all the holes into the tungsten layer. So uh, for the churn insulator, it's actually rather easy to prove compared to the quantum spin oil insulator. And uh, you just need to measure Rx, Rx and Rxy as a function of the magnetic field. <laughs> Sorry. And um, you can actually see that below 2 Kelvin, uh, there is quantized Hall transport uh, with a clear uh, magnetic hysteresis around uh, zero magnetic field. And uh, at the same time, the Rxx becomes much smaller compared to Rxy. And actually, it becomes very small compared to our XY with a small uh, magnetic field on the order of uh, 0.1 Tesla. So these are actually very clear signatures of a churn insulator on the quantum anomalous Hall effect. And the quantization temperature is quite comparable to twisted bilayography in uh, before the Andrea Young's group. Okay. So I think uh, this is uh, rather clear. But what is not clear is that uh, what is the nature of the ground state for the churn insulator? Um, so it turns out that there are actually two possibilities because of the AB stacking uh, structure that they are not exact, they are not the same. Uh, there are two possibilities. One is actually uh, the spin polarized possibility. That in this case we'll be just saying that the holes are occupying both layers, but they have all spin up. And because of the AB stacking structure, that would just mean that the holes have to occupy different values in the two layers. One is K, for instance, the other layer, layer has to be K prime. So we call this a spin polarized a, a ground state, or actually it's maybe more, more, more correct to call it a very coherent a, a ground state because the Fermi energy is actually cutting the bands from both layers from the two different valleys, and the energy gap still has to be open at the Fermi energy. So it, you, have, you have to have some kind of a very coherence in order to uh, produce a churn insulator. So that's a one scenario, we call it a very coherent churn insulator. Yeah, the other scenario is actually the, this one here that um, the holes are again occupying both layers, but they actually occupy the same valley. And because of the AB stacking structure, again, uh, they, the spins will be opposite aligned in the two layers. One is spin up, the other will be spin down. And it's a very polarized a, a trend insulator that the Fermi energy is actually cutting through bands from the two layers, uh, sorry, from the same valley of the two layers. And uh, all the mean field calculation today actually show that this is the most stable configuration uh, in the system. Uh, it's a very polarized a ground state. But it turns out that our experiment actually showed that uh, it's actually this picture uh, rather than that picture. So I'm going to tell you uh, how we make that conclusion of uh, this actually is the, the correct picture, at least from the experimental point of view. And uh, the technique that we use to tell whether it's a spin polarized scenario or a, a 
or in this case would be very polarized, the opposite spin aligned scenario, is to make use of the spin dependent uh, optical transitions in the system. So what I'm showing here is not only about the valence band, I'm also showing the conduction band, which is like one EV above you know, the valence bands. So that's very large energy gap in this gap here. So that you can actually use optical photons to cause the transition the important point here is actually that the optical transitions in the TMDs are locked to the spin. If you use sigma plus light, which is left-handed light, it locks to the transition channel to the upspin. Sigma minus the right-handed light would lock to the transition to the uh, downspin, right? The same for both layers. Actually, the red transition means it's for the Molly layer. The blue transition is the, for the tungsten layer. And you can actually measure each layer separately using optics by using different photon energy and just changing the polarization state. Okay. Then what we actually measure is to re really measure the difference in absorption between the left-handed light sigma plus and the right-handed light. And we call this signal the magnetic circular dichroism or the MCD signal. And it's really sensitive to the spin alignment on each layer, right? If it's actually like uh, in both cases that the spin are co-aligned in the two layers, then you will just get a positive signal for both layers. And if they are entire line, you get you know opposite sign of the MCD for uh, both layers. So it's very clear this, uh, signature. So what do we expect if we actually have a very coherent scenario? Then the two layers will have the same spin, and they will depend on the magnetic field in the same way. They will have the same sign of the MCD signal. Then they will just look something like this uh, for the trend insulator. On the other hand, if it's actually a very polarized scenario, the two spins will be oppositely aligned. Uh, in that case, you actually will start at zero magnetic field. The MCD signal will be opposite sign in the two layers. And until you apply a large enough magnetic field to really flip the spin of the minority layer, then you will actually get the spin polarized scenario at large enough magnetic field. So the two are actually very different, right, in, in, in this case. So in, uh, in our experiment, this is the experimental result, long story short. Uh, the red curve is the transport data, the RXY, it would just become a, a, a quantize immediately with a magnetic field. And the, these other two curves, the black and the blue curves, are actually the MCD results for the two layers. One is for the tungsten layer, the other is for the Molly layer. And you can actually see, you can also zoom in around zero magnetic field, you can see the spontaneous uh, MCD or the spontaneous magnetization in each layer. The important point is actually that they both just co-evolve with the magnetic field. That is a, a consistent, sorry, uh, with this scenario rather than with this scenario here. So I hope that I have convinced you that uh, by just this simple measurement, layer resolved uh, magnetic circular dichroism measurement, we can quite unambiguously conclude that uh, the state, the trans state is actually in this a uh, spin polarized scenario, which is consistent with a very coherent state. <laughs> and one thought would be that it looks like it's actually related to some exotonic mechanism because uh, charges are just pushed from the Molly layer to the tungsten, and they spontaneously form the very coherence, uh, which is actually this naive real state picture, real space picture would be that before the band inversion, all the holes are in the Molly layer, then you apply some electric field, the holes, some of the holes will be pushed to the tungsten layer, and they have very small interlayer hopping. Uh, could the exotonic mechanism be actually important uh, in, in this uh, uh, trend insulator? Yeah. Oh, oh wait, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm lost. Why does this, presumably you could say exactly the same words about exotons for both the spin polarized and the valley polarized. And it's just a question of which exciton is better, right? Yeah, 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 yeah you're, you're correct. You can also say the same thing. Yeah, it's not, uh, yeah, it's not exclusive to this uh, spin polarized channel. And maybe actually, uh, if the, the exotonic mechanism is important, then the, the pairing symmetry would be different in the, in the two cases. Sure will. Okay, uh, then it goes to uh, the last part here that I just want to briefly talk about this state, uh, the transition from this a uh, trend insulator to the uh, intervalley coherent state. Okay. So I will talk about uh, spin susceptibility first, and then I will just uh, let me just first contrast the spin susceptibility in this in this state and in that state. Okay, so uh, for uh, the spin susceptibility for the uh, trend insulator is actually like a ferromagnet. 
So this is the spin susceptibility as a function of temperature. At the bottom is the inverse spin susceptibility as a function of temperature. Uh, at high temperature, it follows a Curie-Weiss law, and you actually get a positive Curie-Weiss temperature. And below the Curie-Weiss temperature, uh, you can actually get the spontaneous other parameter that shows up uh, in the system. And at the same time, when you go the temperature, you know, drop the temperature below the Curie-Weiss temperature, the longitudinal resistance also drops significantly because it enters the trans state with the chiral edge transport. So it's just really like a, a, a ferromagnetic state, which is sort of expected. And then when you go into the this state, uh, uh, things become quite different. Again, this is the susceptibility versus temperature. This is the inverse susceptibility. Uh, at high temperature, it follows the Curie-Weiss law again, but this time the Curie-Weiss temperature is actually negative. It's about negative five Kelvin in this particular scenario. And uh, also, when you cool the temperature below the Curie-Weiss, the absolute value of the Curie-Weiss temperature, uh, there is a susceptibility peak uh, around that temperature. And below this temperature of the peak, the resistivity would just shoot up by orders of magnitude. So it looks like it's actually suggested some kind of phase transition happening to turn on this insulating state. And it's related to magnetism. And the moments are actually interacting with antiferromagnetic interactions. OK, so uh, then we actually cool down our sample you know, from a temperature that is above the Curie-Weiss uh, temperature and then cool below the Curie-Weiss temperature and see how the spin polarization depends on the magnetic field uh, in the system. And you actually see that uh, it goes from a paramagnetic like behavior at high temperature, which is sort of expected, then to it's something like a metamagnetic type of trans, uh, behavior at low temperature. And you can probably see it even more clearly from the MCD spectrum, which is actually a, uh, the, the, the optical spectrum of the MCD signal, right? Uh, this is the photon energy. This is a magnetic field. You can actually see that as we cool the sample below the Curie Weiss temperature. And there is this sudden transition, sudden shift of the peak in the system uh, that is introduced by the magnetic field. And that's really corresponding to this faster jump in the uh, magnetization curve here. So it's suggested that you know, the system, when you cool below the Curie-Weiss temperature, it goes through a uh, magnetic transition that is induced by the magnetic field. You can see this also clearly in the transport data that uh, this is our xx, this is our xy. You can actually see that with increasing magnetic field, the our xx would drop orders of magnitude uh, from an insulating state to a state. It's also a very, it's also an insulating state. Just it's just a trend insulating state because it has, has, the our xy has almost quantized value here. And uh, this kind of a nonlinear behavior with the magnetic field is also seen in the whole transport data. Okay. So it's a uh, I hope I convince you that this is actually looking like a metamagnetic transition that is driven by the magnetic field, turning this antiferromagnetic like insulator into a trun insulator under high magnetic field. Okay. So uh, this is the, uh, the summary of all the data that we have uh, three different regions with increasing electric field. There are three different regions. The first region is a triangular mod insulator, the second region is the trun insulator. The third region is this uh, intervalley coherent antiferromagnetic state. And uh, in the first plot here, I'm showing the Curie Weiss temperature as a function of the electric field causes span inversion. Positive Curie Weiss temperature is only seen in region two, which is the ferromagnetic trend insulator, as expected. At region one and region three, the Curie Weiss temperature is negative. So it shows that the moments are interacting with antiferromagnetic uh, exchange. The middle panel here shows the gap size determined from compressibility measurements. And the charge gap size actually, actually just evolve and close continuously at the second critical point and then reopen after that point. Uh, but in the first transition from one to two, that we actually do not see any sign of charge gap closure. Uh, it's probably a first order phase transition here uh, that the system would go directly from a um, more insulated, triangular lattice, more insulated to a trun insulator. And the bottom panel here is actually showing the spontaneous uh, magnetization, which is only seen in the uh, trun insulator as expected. With increasing temperature, the spontaneous magnetization goes away. So th these are you know, the schematic transition from one, two, three. 
And from one to two, there's no charge gap closure, but from two to three, there is actually a charge gap closure uh, in the system. So I'm sorry, but with, uh, were the transport measurements that indicated the charge gap behavior in your transition from two to three, um, were they mixed with bulk and edge? Were they mixed between bulk and edge? In, in other words, in particular, do you know that the large E phase really is a bulk insulator and all the conduction is from edge? Or could you make a transition from an antiferromagnetic insulator to a kind of spin aligned bad metal? Oh, and um, yeah, just from here to here, the, the RXX you showed us, which was small, was that from one of these measurements that included both edge transport and bulk transport? Yeah, all these measurements are including the edge. Right. So, do, do we know what the bulk does? I guess that's my question as I go uh, into the high E phase here, yeah. To here, right? Uh, the bulk we actually measure it with uh, compressibility, then we know that there, uh, there is a gap. Yeah, no, no, no. My, my question was the high E phase. The high E phase, yeah. You also know there's a bulk gap in that phase so that the low resistance is all from the edge. Oh, sorry, which low resistance is from the edge? Well, you, you, you said here in the high E phase, you showed us behavior of the resistance as you go across this transition from spin polarized turn insulator to the intervalley coherent. Yeah. Thing, right. Yeah. And you showed the resistance got quite small. It's quite large, right? I mean, this is the resistance under zero field. Uh -huh. uh, I think you are talking about this one uh, with my, oops. this one. Yeah, that one. Uh, this is a uh, actually keeping at a, uh, sorry, it's probably not super clear. It's keeping at like this electric field here. Right. And we scan the magnetic field. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I, I'm sorry, I, I misspoke, but, but my question is, in that transition, is the low resistance that you're observing because you're getting an edge state while keeping a bulk gap, or are you destroying the bulk gap? As oh, well? you mean that uh, going from here yeah, to here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We so actually do not know whether, uh, we have okay. not measured the compressibility actually okay. across this transition. Uh, but there is, there looks like a single crossing point that sort of suggested that it may be a, uh, well, you could you could have either scenario. That's what I mean. Uh -huh. Once you destroy the antiferromagnet, you could go to a bad metal, or you could go to a kind of ferromagnetic turn insulator. Uh -huh. right? both, both possibilities can exist in theory. Uh -huh. Anyway, that, thanks. That that answers the question. I was just yeah. I think in in, in, uh, in the small magnetic field and high magnetic field, they should be both gapped, right? Yeah. Uh, it's, yeah. Question. What's happening there? Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. Thanks. Okay, uh, then the last slide is really about uh, contrasting the behavior of like a triangular structure and a honeycomb ladder structure. And sort of a, a nice way to compare it because you can actually tune through this structure using an electric field in a single system. It's a nice way to compare uh, the effects of magnetic frustration. frustration. Uh, in both cases, I'm actually selecting two different electric fields. One is that the, the holes are occupying a triangular lattice. One is that they occupy a honeycomb lattice. They have very similar Curie-wise temperature, negative six Kelvin. And we perform this measurement, the magnetization versus magnetic field at 1.6 Kelvin, that is small compared to the Curie-wise temperature. Uh, you can actually see that when you have a triangular lattice, it seems to be just remaining uh, paramagnetic-like. And uh, in the honeycomb lattice, we actually see signatures of this metamagnetic transition. So it looks like, um, Indeed, when we have a uh, honeycomb lattice, it tends to stabilize the, the long range uh, magnetic ordering uh, more easily. So uh, summary, um, we hope that uh, we convince you that there is actually an experimental realization of K-Malay physics uh, in this system. Uh, I told you about filling factor one, filling factor two, uh, and I think there are many things to actually map out. and. Um, Interesting questions. Uh, many interesting questions remain, such as can we actually increase the temperature of the turn insulator or just increase its charge gap? Can we see superconductivity somewhere when we dope some of this correlated insulating state? Can we realize fractional turn insulator under zero magnetic field? And um, actually, one thing I also want to briefly mention that this is also a nice platform to see a heavy Fermi on physics. Uh, I'm happy to discuss further. Uh, but basically, the idea is that if you dope below filling factor one here, it's actually doping into the Molly layer. And uh, filling, but you dope above filling factor one, you're actually doping into the tungsten layer. And our recent experiment showed that even you dope into the tungsten layer, the mod gap of the Molly layer actually remains. So there is local moment in the system. 
And that's a nice platform around this region here to actually search for a, uh, the condo ladder physics and the uh, epithermia physics around that region. And we have seen, we've been, you know, seeing some uh, uh, encouraging results in that direction as well. Okay, so uh, just to want to acknowledge people involved in this work, uh, we share lab with Professor Ji Shan at Cornell and uh, Ting Xing Li, Sheng Wei Jiang, Zui Tao, and Owen Shen and Li Zhong Li are responsible for the second part of my talk. The first part of my talk about the filling factor two is from the work of Wen Jing Zhao and uh, Taipei Kang. And we acknowledge theoretical support from Liang Fu's group at uh, MIT and Anna McDonald's group from UT Austin. Uh, the optics experiment, we actually collaborated with a, uh, Tony Hines at Stanford. And HP and Crystals are from uh, the famous Japanese group and this are funding sources. And I thank you for your attention. Happy to take more questions. Thank you so much for the beautiful talk. Um, before we start questions, let me just remind you if you want to talk to, uh, he's here today and tomorrow, uh, talk to Diane to get on the schedule. So uh, questions? We have lots. So are you also looking at fractional, like, can you explore any fractional filling in here? Are there any that are particularly interesting or is it unclear? Yeah, actually, uh, yeah, it's, uh, we can actually see fractional states. Unfortunately, not much in transport because uh, the context become fairly bad around this region. We can see from compressibility measurements that uh, you do get fractional states. And there are some interesting behavior around this band immersion point with the electric field. And we are still trying to see if it's a, because we cannot perform transport measurement uh, in that region, we're still trying to see whether it dispersed with magnetic field, like a fraction, you know, mm -hmm. the, insul the trans insulator with the fraction, trans number, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so it's still ongoing, yeah. Yeah. but you do see uh, fractional states, yeah. Mm -hmm. Another question. So, like in the hetero bilayer, like we can combine two different materials. And I wonder, like, for example, here is MOT2 and like WSE2. And if we combine like WS2 and WSE2, like, what's the main difference between the like two structures? Yeah, uh, in principle, you should be able to see similar thing. Uh, the, 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 the only difficulty is actually that the uh, electric field, in order to cause band immersion in the, in the other combinations like the tungsten sulfur and tungsten selenide that you mentioned is too large to be achieved by our gaze because they just break down yeah um, and uh, if we can do that that should we should also see similar thing or just uh, something quite closely to this case and there's a reason that uh, we actually choose this scenario this sample combinations because they have sort of small difference in the valence band and mismatch at zero magnetic zero electric field then we can apply some electric field to introduce a band immersion, yeah. Okay. yeah. Probably naive question, but so, I mean, in, in these systems, it seems like the Fermi level is always near the valence band. Um, is there combinations of TMDs that, um, for whatever reason, put the Fermi level near the conduction band? Is there anything interesting on that side of the, the Fermi level? Yeah, uh, uh, I, I believe so. There should be something interesting that why we are doing it mostly around the valence band is it turns out that this class of material is way easy to form context to the to the whole doping side. Uh, but now there are reports of how to actually make better context to the electron side using bit, bismuth metal. And uh, then I believe that's actually uh, providing us the platform to look at the physics of the electron doping side. Uh, the electron doping side, uh, the spin orbit interaction in the constituent material is actually smaller. So the, the sort of the spin split bands are actually closer to each other. It may be a little bit more complicated than the, than the valence band, right? But complicated is not necessarily a bad thing. So. <laughs> More questions? And uh, online too, I don't see any in the chat, but last call online for questions. I have another question. So I also didn't quite understand what you said at the very end. So 
In some regions, you have triangular lattice, and in other regions, you have honeycomb lattice. So, what determines that? Oh, it's it's really the sorry, uh, it's really the band immersion that's uh, determining that. Uh, so, first of all, we have no experiment that show that they are really like a honeycomb lattice or a triangular lattice. Got it. But so we this have is coming from the theory. Yeah, we have experiment to show that actually where the band immersion point is, because mm -hmm. when after band immersion, some charges are transferred to constant. Mm -hmm. That point we know that. So we definitely know that at which point the charges are really shared between the two layers. But whether these two bands really form a honeycomb, that we have to rely on Got theory. Yeah. But so far it seems that the theory, uh, at least a filling factor equal to two, it does go from a band insulator to a uh, mm -hmm. quantum spin hole insulator. And so it's consistent with this a uh, honeycomb mm -hmm. lattice, but we do not really have an image of where okay. the electrons are. Yeah, yeah. okay. So on, on the one side of your face, face diagram, then the point is that there's it's a non-topological band, and we can just treat it as a triangular lattice yeah, so that would be like here. And then at the band inversion, then we get into the honeycomb because that's just the model we have to model yeah, the band inversion, so basically. Seems to be consistent uh, so okay. far. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But you can't really image some difference between these. Like there is no I, experiment. I think one can image okay. it, yeah, okay, like okay. Uh, using the uh, using STM like yeah. recently in yeah. the, um, uh, in, so in this case it's a little bit more complicated because the, the structure is embedded within the right. gate. Uh, but uh, I don't know whether you mm -hmm. uh, know of recent experiment from Fang Wang's group at Berkeley, uh, Micron is group also, uh, that they actually use if you have a certain charge pattern in this sample. And the gate is quite close to this sample, and the charge pattern will imprint the electrostatic potential mm -hmm. profile on the gate, cool. and they yeah. can image the, the electrostatic Got it. So profile. at least in principle, then you can, can verify actually, what you're yeah, saying. If you're doing you the same peaks. experiment on this sample, mm -hmm. you'll, you'll see whether it's really showing yeah. a honeycomb. And that would be nice. I mean, I think it would yeah. be quite nice. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Yeah. Thanks. Good. So let's end the uh, talk. Uh, thank you again by, for the talk and for, for being so on time. Um, people can go to the staff meeting now. Just a quick reminder, next week uh, we have another quantum cafe, but at a different date on Tuesday. And uh, that will be our last quantum cafe for the semester. Thank you.